Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody in, and, and once again, we're on program number four, so we'll keep right on going, and we can all head out to our various places. But uh, before we go any further, I want to again remind folks of all the uh, books available. We're finishing up now book number 68, and then take note of our web page, just www.lesfeldick.org, real easy to find. And then for the Canadian folk out there, call our regular phone number. If you can't get through with the 800, the 918-768-3218. And again, we just want to make mention of how we appreciate your prayers and your letters, your financial help. All right, this is a Bible study, and uh, our primary concern is to help you study on your own. I don't want anyone to just sit back and hear what Les has got to say about it. I want people to study. And we're getting response, aren't we, honey? Jim, you probably even saw a few verse, uh, letters that said the same thing, how that they are getting into the Word and studying it on their own. Okay, we're going to move on to a different but now, or but whatever, we're going to move on still in Ephesians to chapter 4, to verse 20. And again, not so much because it says, but now, or but God, but it is a great turning point from what went before to what comes after. And that's what we're trying to stress on all these series of lessons. All right, Ephesians 4, we'll read verse 20, and then we'll go back and see what went before. Ephesians 4, verse 20. But you have not so learned Christ. Now, what's he talking about? Go back up to 17. What were we before we became a believer? What were these Ephesians before they became believers? All right, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you hence Forth. I see Paul uses that word over and over to mark a time of something stopping and something beginning. And over and over he'll use that. Uh, we used it, I think, a few programs back. Keep your hand here in Ephesians. Can't help it. We've got to go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, where Paul identifies himself as the beginning of of the body of Christ. There couldn't have been anybody before Paul because he was the first one in that was a result of the gospel of grace. And he makes it so plain here. If uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, dropping down to verse 15. Where before we even read the verse, I've got to define the word chief. It never means the worst like most preachers make it. It always means the head man or the first man or the leader or the primary reason. Now I'll give you one verse for example, Romans 3, 1 and 2, where Paul asked the question, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what is there in being the circumcision? And he answers in the next question, in the next verse. Because chiefly unto them, the nation of Israel, were committed the word of God. Now what does that mean? Well, the main number one reason that they were set apart was that unto them were revealed this book. So the word chiefly means first or primarily or whatever. All right, now look at the verse, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the first, the leader, the uppermost, See, not worst. And we've done this before. Wherever the word chief is used, it never refers to someone sinful or wicked. It always refers to someone who was number one. He gives an example back there in Acts when he was shipwrecked on Malta. That the chief man of the island took them in and was good to them. Well, I made the question then and I'll say it again. Was he the worst on the island? No. He was probably the governor. He was the head man. And so all the way through the scriptures, that word chief 
never means worst. It means the first, the leader, the best, and so forth. All right, now then, next verse. And this is why I came here. The henceforth. How be it? For this cause, because he's the first sinner saved by grace. For this cause I <coughs> obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering or patience for a pattern. That's what he is. Paul is the pattern to them which should. Now here's the word. Hereafter. Okay, we got a point in time before which people were saved by something other. After which they're saved by this gospel of grace. Plain as English can make it. All right, back to Ephesians then. So in verse 17, now from our salvation point forward, we should henceforth not live as we did hereafter, but henceforth that we should uh, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. All right, now Paul is going to give us just a brief description of the Gentile unbelieving world. And it's just as evident today as it was in Paul's day. We're getting closer and closer to the horrible moral depravity of Paul's day as we see the things going on in our own world today. All right, now verse 18. This is the unbelieving world having the understanding darkened. Wow. Do I have to go any further? What's this whole garbage with the Da Vinci Code? It's just simply smattering the understanding of the masses. And a lot of this other stuff would fall into the same category. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Well, that's one way Paul puts it. Let's look at another way. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I have to look at it. I think it's 3 and 4. 2, and four, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 3 and 4. Another reason why the masses do not come to salvation. And you know, I've said it over and over. Why don't they? It's so simple. It's so free. It is so life-enhancing. But they won't. They refuse to. All right, here's another reason. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid... It is hid to them that are lost. In whom? The lost of this world. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them who believe not. Who's blinding them? The God of this world. Did you use that verse, Jim? <laughs> Jim had, can I share it? He passed the, one of our books on to someone, and after they read a little bit, they said, well, they couldn't quite agree with me about who the God of this world was. Well, he used the, chant, the illustration of when Satan offered the kingdoms of this world to Christ. Well, how could he offer the kingdoms of this world if he wasn't the God of this world? Well, the individual bought that. Line. But here's another one. See, it's the God of this world. And who is it? It's Satan. And he blinds the minds of them who believe not, lest, here it comes now, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. But they don't want it. They just don't want it. And so we have to rely on the working of the Holy Spirit to energize them, to convict them, to reprove them, as John 16 says. But anyway, back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18 again. 
Now, after just reading of who blinds them, verse 18 should make a little more sense. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And who puts that blindness in there? Satan does. And the Holy Spirit is the only thing that can overcome it. All right, verse 19. Who? The unbelieving Gentile world in particular. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness. Now this is moral uncleanness with greediness. But here comes the breaking point. That's not where we are. We have come to the verse that follows. But you have not so learned Christ. You've got a new beginning. Some of you have been on that side for a long time now. You've been on this side. All right, verse 21. How do you know you're on this side of this statement? If so be that you have heard him, have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Now here comes what becomes part of our salvation experience that you put off, you lay aside with no more desire to uh, energize it, that you put off concerning the former conversation or manner of living, the old man, that old satanic nature that is in control of the lost person, we have put that aside, and that old man is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. All right, another verse comes to mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 again, where we've been before. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now verse 17. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Second Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 17. Got to wait till you all find it. Then they all get it out on television. All right. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, and I could also add, and Christ in you, <clears throat> as we saw in the last program. All right. If any man be in Christ, he is a new Creation. It's a work of God. Old things are passed away. See what Paul just said in our Ephesians letter? They are the things that are of the corrupt mind. All right, they are passed away. Behold, all things are become what? New. It's a different life. Again, I wish you could read our mail. Over and over, they say, it's just like somebody dropped a sandbag off of my back. It's just like a big load has been lifted. All my guilt is gone. I'm at peace with God. That's what it is. And then the world shrinks from it. I can't understand it. But that's where it's at. It's a new life. Old things are passed away. All things become new. All right, back to Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It's a whole changeover, see? And that you put on the new man. Now, that's a Pauline term. You won't find that anywhere else in Scripture, that you become a new person, see? After which God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now then. If you have experienced God's true saving grace, here's part of the change in your lifestyle. Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Now he's speaking, of course, of fellow believers in the Ephesian church. Be angry. We can be upset. Paul was. 
but don't let it bring you to a place of, of anger that becomes dangerous. Sin not. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Verse 27, neither give place to the devil, who is our adversary, remember. Verse 28, these are all just simple admonitions for the believer. Let him that stole, steal no more. Now let me ask you, do you suppose these converts of Paul coming out of paganism, do you think stealing was something strange to them? <laughs> are you kidding? That was their normal lifestyle. I remember a missionary years ago, and I always remember they had been down in South America someplace, and in that particular culture, it was not wrong to steal anything less than $300. That was the limit. If you stole over $300 worth, th then you were committing sin. But see, that's man's approach to all these things. But the Bible says you don't steal at all. See? All right. But rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Now verse 29. My, if this isn't, isn't appropriate for movies and television today. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to use of edifying, that it may minister grace to their hearers. Now verse 30, remember we just saw in the last program, the Holy Spirit is indwelling. So now the admonition is, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed to the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, now like this one, forgiving one another, even as God has already what? Forgiven you. If you're forgiven, then who are you to say, I can't forgive my neighbor. All right, I think we got time for our next one, which will jump into Philippians chapter 2. Yeah, verse 27. And this will wind up the fourth program this afternoon. Philippians chapter 2, verse 27. And then we'll go back again the same way. We'll go what went before, and then hopefully if we have time, we'll pick up what goes after. Verse 27. Now when we re come back and read it, we're talking about Epaphroditus up in verse 25. But indeed, Paul says, he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy. But God. Otherwise, Epaphroditus would have probably passed on. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon Sorrow. All right, let's go back and see what leads up to this man Epaphroditus being sick nigh unto death. All right, let's jump all the way up to verse 17, honey. Philippians chapter 2, we'll go back to verse 17 and pick up, but God had mercy. And I want to bring it, if I have time, to bring it into our everyday situation of prayer requests on behalf of those who are sick or uh, maybe injured or whatever the case may be. All right, verse 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy, rejoice with you all, for the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. In other words, it was that fellowship between the apostle and these Philippian believers. Verse 19, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. In other words, you've got to remember, back in antiquity, he couldn't pick up the cell phone and call Philippi, could he? <laughs> and uh, here he is down in a far-off place. I don't remember exactly where he is when he wrote Philippians. I think maybe he was in Corinth. But uh, see if my Bible tells it. Uh, it doesn't tell me, and I don't remember exactly where it was. No, it's a prison letter, of course. It was written from prison in Rome. I'm sorry. He's in prison in Rome, and he's concerned about the fate of all of his little congregations of Gentiles. 
And see, so the only way he can find out what's going on up in Philippi is to have Timothy go up and report back to him how the believers up there were doing. All right, now then, back in Philippians 2, verse 20. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. See what he's concerned about? How are the believers up there in Philippi faring? He's in prison. He can't go and see him, so he sends Timothy. All right, so now that's the man that he means when he says who is like-minded. Verse 21, For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ, but you know the proof of him. They knew all about Timothy, that as a son with a father he has served me in the gospel. Him, Timothy, therefore I hope to send presently so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I almost myself shall come shortly. In other words, he was hoping to get out of prison and be able to continue his journeys. Now verse 25. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. In other words, Epaphroditus was a member of the Philippian congregation. He had come down to visit Paul in Rome, and evidently in Rome he had gotten sick, nigh unto death. And when the Philippians heard about it, my, their heart was just poured out to God on his behalf. All right, verse 26. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because you had heard that he was or had been sick. I see, that's common everyday experience, isn't it? We all have it. We all have someone that we love getting sick. And that's why we have prayer time before we start the, the television. We like to be able to share our needs and corporately bring them into the throne room. Well, this is a good lesson in that, that Paul is commending the Philippian church for remembering one of their fellow people in prayer because of his sickness. Okay? Verse 27, For indeed, Paul says, he was sick nigh unto death. Now here's the but. But God. Why? Because of their prayer. They had prayed for the man, and God heard their prayers. But God had mercy on him not only for healing the man from his sickness, but to spare Paul the grief of losing him. Now, you've got to remember, the man's circle of friends in prison in Rome was not all that large. And to have lost one of his closest workers, it would have been devastating. But, oh, but God moves in. You know, I, I've had such response to this series of programs on the but gods and but now because I think it's pointing up it makes a difference when God moves in it's going to make a difference and so this is the whole thing here all right now then verse 28 I sent him therefore the more carefully now I think by that he means he had trepidations for whatever reason he said, I sent him carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful because of his now removing himself from Paul's companionship in Rome in prison. And he's evidently going back to Philippi. Now verse 29. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold him in reputation because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. Now, we don't know what the situation was. Not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. All right, now with that, I'm going to end up the program here with chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And I've used them over and over. When people call in on the phone or write for prayer or for whatever need may be, a job, maybe a family member is in trouble with the courts or whatever. Oh, you'd be amazed. The problems that people have to endure. 
It's unbelievable. All right, now here is a concrete scripture that we can share with every one of them. And you can. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be careful or worry about nothing. But, here's the other flip side again. But in everything, God doesn't limit you to what you can bring to the throne room. As long as it isn't frivolous and silly, of course. But you can come into the throne room with whatever prayer need you may have. Whatever it is, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. You know what? That's the key to the successful, victorious Christian life. Thankfulness. Thank the Lord every day, beloved, for whatever you've got. Your health, your home, your family, your fellow believers your relationship with God, everything, be daily thankful. That's what God expects. And when you have a specific request, you thank him ahead of time for what he's going to do. Okay, reading on. So by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. What does that tell you? You verbalize it. Don't take the attitude what God knows. Well, of course he does. But what does Scripture admonish? You tell him. You verbalize it. You communicate with him. And don't just go on your way and think, oh, well, God knows all about it. He'll... No, we pray. That's the whole idea. All right? Let it be made known unto God. And then verse 7 is where we always leave everybody we talk to. Whether God answers specifically, immediately, or whether he says, maybe later, or whether he says, no, the answer to every prayer is verse 7. And the peace that passeth all understanding shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Could you ask for anything more? My, we can pray, we can leave it in the throne room, and then we can rest assured. It's in his care. I verbalized it. We've told him our needs, and then we thank him for what he's going to do, and we can go on with the peace that passeth all understanding. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.